extended to individuals and congregations that want to submit original artwork. I'm going to ask Ann Peterson, our Synod Vice President, to uh, extend that invitation personally here. Ann? Thank you. Paul and I were together yesterday at a funeral, of Pastor Leo Cook McDowell. From Lewiston, a wonderful service, and, and as part of our trip, we were discussing uh, the upcoming Synod Assembly, which Paul is part of the planning team for the Synod Assembly. Uh, but one of the most exciting things I think happening this year, there are two new things happening, and one is an art exhibit that's being put together by the planning team, and the theme is something like art as family, that's very close to the theme. And hopefully you will be hearing a little bit more about it as we get closer, but I do want to plant that seed. I know there are some several artists in the audience this morning, and if you know of other several artists, we really would love to be represented there. Um, so if you have works or know of other several artists that have works that you think might be good for an exhibit, it can be um, uh, painting, sketching, sculpture, any, any uh, art or craft form that in some way represents um, family and art. That is the theme of the assembly. So we really would love to have some girl represented because we know how much talent is here. So that's the first thing. Yes, George. Does that include paint by numbers? You know, I think about that. Which would be the only thing I would need. Yeah. <laughs> that is not my, my skill set. So please um, keep that in mind. And the other thing is that on Saturday of Senate Assembly, uh, and by the way, Senate Assembly is the first Friday and Saturday. Um, on Saturday, there are 24 different workshops being offered related to um, to youth, children, youth, and family, and faith. And several Zumbo members are presenting. I know Sue is presenting. Um, I believe Pastor Shelley and some of the other members of our children, youth, and family, or FAM now, family ministry team. And there may be others. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. Uh, but some wonderful workshops, and they are open to anyone to attend, not just voting members of the assembly. Also, there's a day camp being provided for children. Um, the Good Earth Village staff is helping to organize that. So if you know of other young families that you think would like to come, please encourage them because there will be some wonderful activities for children as well. So keep the Synod Assembly Weekend on your radar, and hopefully we can read more about it in our own several publications as well. You can always check out the Synod website, also www.semnsynod.org for all the Thank you. Thank you, Rand. And uh, I was talking, by the way, I was talking to Jerry just uh, a few minutes ago and uh, asked him if there was a possibility of having some Barb's work displayed at the Senate Assembly. And he said, yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure you mentioned it. <laughs> and so uh, I look forward to that. Uh, Jerry Anderson, I have had the pleasure of claiming him as a friend uh, for a couple of years now. And uh, every so often I learn more about this man. I, I, I can tell you that he is a son of the Red River Valley, uh, born and raised in Burgess Falls. No. No. Oh, you're not. <laughs> The Red River Valley of the North. <laughs> um, and and uh, uh, he wears it with distinction and honor and pride and sometimes humility. Uh, a graduate of Concordia College and then on 
for his master's at uh, North Dakota State University and then Iowa State University. No. I, I don't, no, no, no. I, I was looking at Emmy when I said that. <laughs> the University of Iowa, excuse me. Ooh. That's almost as bad as slipping and, uh, and, and thinking of the University of North Dakota as NDSU. That's, that's sort of a horrible mistake. But, uh, so Concordia, NDSU, University of Iowa, his focus concentration in history has been modern Britain, modern Europe, recent America, and the Reformation. But I also know that besides having Mary Duell to a fantastic artist that we will hear more about this morning, uh, he has sort of a shadow side. And he's a mystery writer and published. Uh, I, I happen to have his, one of his uh, Murder in Religi or Paul's Bloody Trousers. <laughs> um, that was a walleye that got murdered. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and, he, and his uh, kind of character that he builds around is Sheriff Palmer Knutz. I don't even pretend to start saying that the way, the way uh, uh, I, my, just my, my Norwegian accent always kind of comes out Jewish. <laughs> but a uh, wonderful series that he's written as a mystery writer. And I think you can find it uh, occasionally. Uh, Barnes & Noble has them in, in stock. And, uh, and I would suspect that you would even autograph it if somebody bought one and said, directly for me. You can buy it right now. Jared. Also, he's not just a mystery writer, but he uh, he has written a number of scholarly works. But he's also done a historical novel. And now, those of you with that kind of Norwegian blood in you, okay, or married to Norwegian, my sister-in-law gave me a, a mug with a Norwegian flag on it that said, being married to a Norwegian builds character. <laughs> <laughs> I won't pursue that any further. But his wonderful historical novel called The Ufta Trial. And I know that part of the actual historical accuracy is that his father was involved in that uh, incident and trial long before Jerry was born. So, see, I wanted you to find out something different about Jerry. Let's have the adventure of exploring Barbara. Certainly intended to paint for another 20. 
25, 30 years. Uh, her mother, for instance, is 95. Her grandfather died at age 100. Who knows she had pancreatic cancer at the age of 59. Uh, she left behind an awful lot of art supplies and canvases and paints, which I'm donating to Concordia College. She taught there for 17 years as gallery director there. Uh, about five years ago, we quit. I was the professor at NDSU. She was at Concordia. Uh, too young to retire, but we had dreams of doing all kinds of things. We moved down to Rochester for a number of reasons, part of the family. Uh, and one of the reasons we came here is because Barb found this place where she could have this great studio that she'd always dreamed of. So the idea was she would paint, I would write, we would have adventures. And for the first couple of years, that's exactly what we did. Everything worked out as it should. Well, uh, a year ago, last December, she had a retrospective of her work at Concordia. Uh, and as in connection with this, she gave an address uh, at Concordia College <coughs> explaining some of her work. I was asked to talk about her work, and I feel a little bit uh, anxious in doing this, especially with the abstract stuff. She'd be painting away in her studio, and I'd come down and say, what's that? She said, well, I'm not sure what I'm going to title this yet, but I'm thinking of, ah, well, thinking, what, what is that supposed to be? I'd say, well, she'd say, well, what do you see? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, uh, there's a ducky in a horse. <laughs> and she never said, it was, well, oh, that's interesting. I can see where you'd see that. Well, explain, no, she never would explain things because that's the way she looked upon abstract art. It's clearly in the mind of the older as it were. So, this uh, was about an hour presentation. I'm starting it a little bit late. Uh, and I thought about, you know, fast forwarding, cutting, and so on. But uh, there's no real place to do this. Uh, by having her talk, you not only can see, you know, a very beautiful woman, but also her uh, articulation, her knowledge of art, and the things that made her such a wonderful teacher. Um, they, when this was going to be on, I thought, you know, it'd be nice to have this recorded. And I knew she'd say, oh, I don't want that. So I didn't ask her. I called the art department, Concordia, directly, and said that. Uh, unfortunately, they use for study kits, you know, that's the way work study kids are. They, they didn't get the first part on, so they, they missed about 10 minutes or something, which is too bad because she opened this uh, with all sorts of gags. I mean, she had them rolling in the aisles, and then she got serious. But here is uh, work from, oh, the beginning of her professional career. Uh, it's a painting like this that uh, resulted in her most, at least, famous sale when she sold the painting to Roman Polanski. Uh, and who knows where it is now? Last I heard, <laughs> he was in Caliban Films in London. So uh, here she's explaining her evolution in color. Two color, it stays kind of earthy. But I had a teacher who, who said, um, there are two kinds of people who use a lot of color. People who know a lot about color, people who don't know anything about color. <laughs> I recognize that I didn't know anything about color. So I started to do still lights, a lot of still lights. So I was looking at natural color, reproducing natural color. Um, uh, our son Carl was helping me get this PowerPoint together, and uh, he brightened this. <laughs> because you can do that now, it, it, it's, it's not that bright. 
But that plot, look, it looks like a piece of iron. But then, having done all those still lights, then when I got the theme of um, Isaiah's um, piece of a kingdom, and I got on with this, I mean, animals didn't, didn't occur to me. Uh, but someone called me out of the blue and asked if I would do uh, an image of Aslan, the lion from the Narnia books. And at that point in time, I hadn't read them. And so I read all the books, did all this research, started drawing, drawing lots of things, and lion, lion, and I'm not doing that, but then I became interested in this whole animal thing, and then the Isaiah thing. I thought, well, that's, that's kind of neat. Went to zoos, went to um, Chicago to the Field Museum, and uh, they stood still, so that was. And uh, did lots of drawings, and then put it together like I would put together the other compositions. And that, um, that child bit was my, my best friend, who was an adult woman. But uh, at least she would get into poses for me, and I could draw her and then kind of, you know, I went through one. There were a lot of paintings in the series. And then more still lights. Just a, a good kind of a, an academic thing to keep to keep doing that, to keep studying color. By looking at real color, reproducing real color. And then this 
one uh, was trying something something new. Like, how much do you need to show to get the point across? So I don't need the whole body um, to get the idea that these that these children are moving in a certain direction. This is called burdens of a journey. And so I have, uh, there's the constellation over over this one. It, it's this journey through life. Now some people, some people have their fate written at the time they're born. There are people who are, go through life with something to tote. The homebody, the traveler. I honestly can't remember what the bird is all about. And then I started doing some, some portraits. This is Anna Clarnan, those of you who know her. Um, my very good friend in Moorhead. Uh, we met through our children and uh, called each other every day. And uh, I, I love that dress. I coveted that dress. <laughs> I had to wear that dress um, when I was working on her. And then the, the question was, I needed something next to her. What was going to be next to her? Um, and finally, I ended up, her, her youngest daughter, Louise, um, has, a, has a little pink corduroy jacket. And we were in a babysitting co-op, and we babysit, our kids were at each other's houses a lot. And uh, that was a good, that was a good symbol. This is Carl, his French horn. And during this, this phase, um, you notice the paint is very flat. There's not a lot of uh, action happening in the color areas. I was really simplifying and stylizing to a certain extent. This is Paul, our younger son. Yeah. Just the other day, Carl said, um, why is it that you let Paul paint on that painting? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, didn't you have him paint the keys on the... <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I did that, and I know they don't look. <laughs> <laughs> and this is Nancy Smeebel, who's here. Um, I know Nancy Smeebel, we just talked about this thing for 33 years, and I think this was the only point she had a permanent in her hair. <laughs> But this again, I love this dress. I love the pattern in the dress that I want to have this here. And uh, Nancy uh, is a worrier. She, she tends to worry about her kids, her family. She worries about things. And um, she's, she's not sitting back in her chair. You know, I wanted to, to get that part of Nancy that hits her with you. And this is Carla Paul. <laughs> this is called the bad dream. Um, Paul would uh, have night terrors. You know what that is? When you, um, you're so scared. You, you don't wake up, and yet you're terrified. And uh, we, we, he would run to, and we could not wake him up. And uh, and he wouldn't remember later what the dream was about. But I incorporated things in this painting that were. Um, Things he was scared of and things that I was scared of. Uh, it was weasels that he was afraid of from that book movie. Who framed Roger Rabbit? Who framed Roger Rabbit? That's a weasel character. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they scared him so much. But I didn't want to put a weasel in it because I thought that was scary. So I incorporated that. Yeah. Um, this is Carl. This is Carl. Um, this is Carl. 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 And I thought, wow, that's amazing. It made me think of Ben Sean, you know, talking about something personal and how it can reach. And this is called Sadness Comes Like a Blackbird. And this is Orlis. Lee. Yeah, okay. And uh, 
and I watched him. It was each section I watched him paint. And I came back and, uh, and do oils, and this was uh, one of the first oils after that. And it was abstract. You always said there's, I think there's a, an abstract artist inside you that wants to come out. And so this is not objective, it's not anything. Uh, but it was really fun to do. It was fun to push that oil paint around and stays wet. And uh, this was, now I think it's pretty safe to say that the rest are all oils now. So we'll see. And so it's still like the oils. Steam, steam iron balance. And this is, um, this is Paul, actually. I got on top of the garage, and I took photographs of um, our sons and my husband playing basketball. And uh, so it's kind of looking down on them. And this, this caught Paul in a pose, sort of like that. called Brothers Connected. So I think about our, our two sons, and uh, Carl just seems so ethereal, so uh, not of this world. Uh, and then Paul who seems so grounded in the earth. I thought uh, were intriguing. 
Yeah, sometimes they were the basis for for some of the abstract paintings. This is called letting go. So this is about the time my uh, kids are leaving to go to school, to college. Hard to let go. It's called women's work.
gallery too. Um, it's called Collapse of Faith. Um, I had this idea of doing this, but it's tricky to draw figures in space like this. So um, I suggested that Carl would fall down the stairs. And, uh, <laughs> and he was all for that, but uh, Paul less so. But um, I could, I could, I could place them at least. I could put them at the bottom of the stairs, you know, or, or put them in, in positions and do, and do drawings. This is Portage Two, the Navigators. Here in Charlie Hoodie got this one. <coughs> Smithereens to fully intact 
There was one with a fully intact uh, airplane, but it was upside down. You think, well, how did that happen? How was it going to be upside down and be fully intact? But the nose cone was off, so it must have, you know, gone like that and then gone over. But as I as I went through these photographs and I thought about these disaster series that I have been working on, um, this seemed to fit. But it also seemed to fit in with this whole beatitudes thing. Why? And why? Why would that work? But this is one of the what this is one of those photographs. I started to make small studies of these areas. These are just 20, 21 by 21 or something. Uh, the small studies of the airplanes. That's fuselage that's kind of broken. Another one of the photographs. Now the next painting is based on this photograph. So this was, this was Blessed Are the Meek. Here's this huge, huge monster thing that's fallen down and become nothing. A meek kill in here, here. This one I was working on uh, when 9-11 happened, which was sort of odd. It, I mean, I felt like I shouldn't be doing this or maybe I should be doing this. I, I, I didn't know. And this, this is from the airplanes, too. There's parts of airplanes there. But uh, this one is called Blessed Are They Who Mourn, or They Should Be Comforted. Um, because uh, Gary Reck was a well-known Minnesota artist uh, guy right when I was working on this. And uh, he was a friend of mine. Uh, I was sad about this, and, the, and some of the wings became angel wings. This is what's out of the merciful. Um, I found a photograph of a, a plane that crashed, a small plane that crashed in the water on a lake, a Minnesota lake. And there were people rowing out to save the survivors, to save the people in the in the airplane. And the airplane just became more um, butterfly, I guess, long flight. But this is called Blessed Are the Merciful. And then this isn't part of that Beatitude series. This is um, quieting the meaning, quieting the meaninglessness. Propeller down. This is called Sanctuary. It's a, it actually was taken from a photograph of uh, Ground Zero. Aerial photograph of what the ground looked like. And this was going to be my last airplane. I had done enough airplanes. This is going to be the last one. Uh, this is uh, winter solstice. This is chasm. This, oddly enough, was after a trip to Switzerland. Saw so that beautiful blue. But end up being the red painting. Um, and so this this little bridge across these, these this mountain pass. Well then there's another airplane. Um, <laughs> this is called The Place My Father Knew. And it's in two canvases. And I was working on the left one and thought, oh I need more, I need more space. So I added another canvas. Can you tell that that's an airplane with the cockpit? I asked that because someone just the other day saw that in my living room and said, oh yeah, it's a guy bending over in the <laughs> toy. I mean, we all see, when we look at abstract art, we all bring our own experiences to looking at art. So at least we might be different from what somebody else sees. And there really is no right and wrong to that. This is called Horizon. Wing loop. I started uh, 
sewing pieces of canvas, putting wire inside to um, have additions. It, it, it felt like there was, there was a need to come out of the canvas. It doesn't mean anything. It's a composition. I like this. Um, this, this painting is called um, St. Michael the Archangel. It's, it's fairly large. And Pam Dolliker bought this painting. Um, there is, I, I guess when I think about St. Michael the Archangel battling Satan, I, I don't know if I've seen images, enough images in my past of, of the angel with the, you know, pushing down evil somehow. And this, I had come across a photograph I haven't seen before. Uh, in the British Museum, there is a, a small bronze head with a wing coming out of it. Um, that's Hypnos, the Greek god of sleep. And I hadn't heard of Hypnos, but that makes sense you think of hypnotism. Um, but this, this resting head with the wing, I thought, well, that's neat. I've got to find that next time I go to the British Museum. But, um, so I wanted this, this sense of, uh, of, of a sleep, sleep time. And then the dream was happened because of that. So this is called Hypnos, the Greek god of sleep. I can't leave the painting, the, the planes alone. Um, <laughs> now this is the last airplane painting. <laughs> but I got this uh, diffuse canvas uh, from Jeff Knight, who had been a student of mine. He was moving from uh, from Oregon, and he could move this, this five by six feet. Um, yes, yes. There's nothing like a blank canvas. <laughs> and uh, so it sat in my garage until we moved to Rochester, where I could finally fit it into a studio that I got now. And so the first thing I did was, was work on this. This is called Road to Redemption. There's something about needing to, um, to be destroyed, to come alive again. It's in Christian theology. It's, um, so something is destroyed when it comes like Phoenix. This is called Fairy Tale. It's very recent. So um, the only thing you can get on a fairy tale here is that there's, there's woods in the background. I think of both the old German fairy tales. And this is part of the uh, Living Boss series of this uh, in the bridge. Uh, there are there are seven. I talked to Roy Hammerlin uh, because he knows all about he is, he is a religion here. He knows all about those seven seven deadly sins, seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, the seven, all those seven in medieval religion. And I said, you know, I want to do a series of paintings, um, but I've kind of got the Wizard of Oz in my head. Oh, he he loved that, and he just ran with it. And he said, yes, yes, yes. He said, uh, and he wrote this long email back about, uh, oh, this is what you can do. You, know, you, get, you can have uh, uh, Andy M and Uncle Henry, and that would be steadfastness. You could have um, uh, the Tin Man in <laughs> And so he, he had this whole list for me. So all the titles are his in this series. But uh, that was a fun one to do. And I still, there's seven. I want to do eight because I've got to do Toto, which is loyalty. Toto, Toto's important. And I didn't want to do Dorothy. I kind of decided that then. He, he had for Dorothy um, striving to do what is right. And um, I thought, I thought of uh, Dorothy as being wimpy, wimpy, you know, always crying about her. And uh, I was saying this to Anne McLaren, who said, oh no, she said, Dorothy is all about hope. She's all about hope. And I thought, yeah, I, I've got to do Dorothy. And so uh, the Dorothy one is not here, but it's these little, these little ovals that are, one oval is still on the mountaintop. The rest of them are all flying up there, but this one is trying to get lift. That's the whole thing. And then uh, this one uh, on the left, that's uh, the wizard education, I said. And so the idea of education being a portal you go through to become enlightened. Uh, the second one, Glinda, um, no, not Glinda, um, the lion, courage. There's a storm going on. And then the third one is um, uh, the scarecrow, 
wisdom, compassion, and a steadfastness. We're going to read that to you. Okay, and then the bridge fell in Minneapolis, I-35 bridge. And I thought, wow, this is a, I mean, it fit into the whole disaster thing that I've been doing. And there was a, the, the Tribune kept having picture after picture of this of this fallen bridge. And I thought, kids, the idea of a bridge falling down is brought with that metaphor. And so uh, this was taken from, I think, three different photographs of that that damage. And so the red is the iron girders. Oops. And this is I-35 aerial view. Reverse 
does at the end, talking about we went to Greece and Turkey, and uh, how inspired she was uh, by all this fantastic uh, Hellenic and Hellenistic art that we saw every place. Uh, it had become quite a hobby of ours over the last few years to just visit ancient places. Uh, we were just enthralled with Pompeii. We crawled down into prehistoric sites in Cornwall and Wales. Uh, and of course, uh, Turkey, Ephesus, we were there. And uh, you know, Athens and Lydia and we just enjoyed all that stuff. Perhaps the highlight was going down the Nile and going into the pyramids for heaven's sakes. And so when she's saying, she's talking about uh, the things we had seen in Greece, that was going to be her new project. Uh, this was in December of a year ago. Uh, about six weeks later, the doctor informed her that cancer had returned and her situation was hopeless and terminal. And so all those great things never got me. Uh, but I'm glad that I had the opportunity to show her art around here. This is a wonderful display case. Not display case, display uh, room, whatever. Uh, I have about 17 of her works of art around here. Uh, that's about one third of what I have. As I said, I've turned her studio into kind of a gallery. If anybody wants to see more, please you know, contact me, show you all the rest. Uh, if there's anybody here who is uh, from Mayo, which has an enormous amount of display space, uh, again, they are for sale. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you so much. This is uh, our answering questions at the end of it. And so it's time we stop. And thank you for being here. No adult for next Sunday. And the Sunday after that, I go. I will. Um, so that you know, the Sunday after that, all right, I'll talk about it. Um, we are going to be having a three parts class that will be taking place um, in April the 15th, 22nd, and 29th. James Lindbergh, who was a professor emeritus at the seminary, was here last year, uh, will be taking a look at um, how it all began. Starting with creation and the cosmos, he is I'm an Old Testament scholar, but also a bit of an interest as interest in science. And so we'll be taking a look at um, some of the beginning of the beginning of creation, um, holding in tension the biblical texts that we know of, and um, also holding in tension a video that came out last year called The Journey of the Universe. Um, and so I invite you to come. Those three weeks will be fascinating. They'll be biblically based, but also um, a chance to say, how do science get faith? Get together and what we do with that. So please come next week to the Easter breakfast and then plan to come the 15th, 22nd, and 29th to your Vancouver. Jerry, many, many, many thanks for sharing Barbara's heart with us um, and her words with us down here, um, and especially for allowing us to display her paintings upstairs. They will get with us. Thank you.